everybody. This is Erica, the technology nerd likes to film stuff, and it is time for the full in depth, all you need to know Galaxy S8 and Galaxy S8 Plus review. Now, this is going to be a super long in depth review, so I'm going to time code it. Please check out the time codes in the description so that you can jump around from topic to topic. Or, of course, you can just watch the whole thing through. Also, this is a two-part review. So in this first part, I'm talking about the display, the look and the feel of the device, all the features that this device has, and there are a lot of them. And then in part two, I will approach the more technical side where we're talking about performance, battery life, the camera, etc. So please stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, I hope I can help you decide which device is for you, if either of them. So let's go ahead and check them out. Now, the very first thing I think needs to be addressed in this review is which device should you go for? Should you go for the Galaxy S8 or for the Galaxy S8 Plus? And this has actually been a back and forth thing for me, and I've used these both together extensively, so I have some ideas. So obviously, you can see that there is quite a bit of a size difference, and if you're somebody who wants a smaller device, obviously the Galaxy S8 is going to be a better choice. We have some devices here. This is the Google Pixel. You can see that it's a similar size to the Google Pixel. It's just a little bit taller, but still a very manageable phone because it's not very wide. Whereas if you're somebody who doesn't mind the size as much, we have the iPhone 7 Plus right here, and you can see that they're comparable in size. The Galaxy S8 Plus is just a little bit taller, where you can see the iPhone is just a hair wider. So this just gives you an idea. This is a pretty big phone. So if you can't handle a large phone, go for the smaller one. The next thing to look at is display size, and the Galaxy S8 Plus has a 6.2 inch screen, and we're actually learning that the size of the displays are just a little bit smaller than advertised because of these curves that we have here. But still, this is about a 6.2 inch display versus a 5.8 inch display. So if you're somebody who absolutely loves watching media on your phone, I really have to say go for the larger one for obvious reasons. There's just more screen real estate to enjoy your content. But another thing that I'm noticing is that there is a larger flat viewable surface area compared to the Galaxy S8. And the curves on these devices are actually quite pronounced this time. So I find that the glare is a lot more distracting with these curves on the Galaxy S8, the smaller phone versus the larger one. So the larger flat surface area makes the curves less of a disturbance. So if glare bothers you, go for the larger phone. The last little tidbit as to which size device I think you should get depends on which look that you like a little bit better. I prefer actually the look of the Galaxy S8 Plus. I think things just look more nicely proportioned. You've got more room on the sides here, where this one just feels like things are kind of more compacted and more crowded. That's probably nitpicky, but you see, it just comes down to difference. This is a prettier looking phone to me, just because of proportions. So the device that I prefer using is the Galaxy S8 Plus overall, just because of that larger screen real estate. It really helps when watching content. Like I mentioned, I prefer the look of this phone. So this is the one that I'm definitely going to go with, even though this one fits my hands a little bit better. Oh, before I forget, one last little tidbit is that hardware-wise, these guys are pretty much exactly the same, except for this has a larger display, a little bit larger battery. Other than that, they're the same. And so far, with the differences in battery between both of these guys, I really haven't seen anything significant. I'm going to run an extra battery test in part two of this review. I'll be talking more about what those results look like, but I don't really see anything hugely different so far. So taking a bit of a look around these devices, let's start with the front. We have a 5.8 or a 6.2 inch display. We've got lots of sensors on the front here. We have your LED notification light. You can see it went off right now. We have the infrared LED. This is for the iris scanner. You have the ambient light sensor, proximity sensor. You've got your receiver, your eight megapixel front facing camera and the iris camera. And at the bottom, you have a hardware slash software button. Now you have the option to keep the software button on, or you can have it turned off. It's part of the always on display, and Samsung says not to worry about this on screen button because it moves around a couple of pixels every so often so it doesn't burn in. This was my initial concern. But just as a side note, my other part of that concern is that once the display is on, these navigation buttons always stay on. I haven't seen them shift around. Someone can correct me if they feel like it. But once these stay static like this for a while, they could burn in. So that's just my thought. On the left hand side, we've got the volume rockers and the Bixby buttons. On the right hand side are the power buttons. On the top, we've got the SIM card trays, which also includes the SD card slot. You've got a microphone here. 
Then on the bottom we have a standard headphone jack, USB-C charging port, another microphone, and the single speaker here at the bottom. Taking a look at the back, we've got a single LED flash, the sensor for Samsung Health. We've got the 12.2 megapixel camera, which use a different sensor than last year, but essentially looks like the same setup, and the fingerprint sensor. Now, of course, the batteries are locked in, but we do have wireless charging and quick charging on the bottom, and also NFC as well. Now, moving on to the look and the feel of these devices, these are absolutely gorgeous phones. And the curves of these devices lend really well to feeling really nice in the hand. I thought that the Galaxy S7 Edge felt nice in the hand. This definitely feels a little bit nicer. So it takes kind of on the aesthetic appeal of the Galaxy Note 7 with these curves. And you can see that we've got this chrome-like shiny finish. I know a lot of people prefer this matte finish that was on the Galaxy S7 Edge. But luckily I haven't seen this really getting scratched or aging badly. So I don't have many complaints. Plus I think the Galaxy Note 7 was very similar too. Now on the front, all the models are black. So gone is the age of the same themed color being on the front. So no matter what color you have on the back, the front is going to be black. And I actually prefer that because it does hide all these sensors here at the top. It looks nice, it looks clean. So you can choose any color device that you'd like without having to worry about it looking gaudy on the front. So I think that's a good choice. Now moving on to thoughts about durability. And I've seen some torture tests of this device and they do seem to hold up pretty well overall. So if you drop them, they do seem to keep on functioning for quite some time, but what's really the concern is the aesthetic of these devices, and they do crack easily, particularly on the back. You can thank that due to having nice curves here. Gorilla Glass 5 has a certain speck of strength, but once you go curving the glass, it can weaken that specification for the strength. So the first thing I usually see when these fall is that the back cracks. It seems the front holds up a little bit better, but will crack as well. So I would get a case or a bumper or something. Even just get a skin if you're worried about scratches. The interesting thing about scratches is that over time, once you get more and more scratches, it weakens the glass. So it's not just the aesthetics of scratches you have to worry about. A lot of scratches over time does weaken the glass and it can crack because of that. So protect your glass. A good case that I like, particularly for the smaller phone, is this Rhino Shield Crash Guard bumper. And I do use this. This is my favorite case. You've got 11 feet of drop protection. If it falls on the concrete, it's fine. Just obviously if there's any pebbles or uneven surface that can hit the glass, it's not gonna be fine. But most likely if it takes a spill or a tumble, it's gonna fall on the edge and you should be okay. Better safe than sorry. And at least with this, you can see your beautiful back. Although they do offer a back protector. So now let's get really nitpicky about things. Some of you guys like that, some of you guys don't, but I'm gonna do it anyway. First thing to comment on is the position of this fingerprint sensor. For me, muscle memory has kicked in and I don't even think about it anymore. For the bigger one or the smaller one, it's very simple for me to find that fingerprint sensor now. And I'm not smudging up the camera most of the time. Though it does remind you sometimes when opening up the camera application to clean your lens. So I think they put this here in terms of symmetry, but I also heard some rumors that their under the glass finger scanner wasn't ready, so they had to put it on the back rather than just not using it at all. And due to symmetry, this is where they've placed it. Another thing to point out is the location of the Bixby button. I find that when trying to hit the power button or just when shimmying the phone in my hand, that it's easy to execute this button. I'm not doing this as often as I was when I first got the device, but it is something to note. There are people who have still found ways to remap this button so you can at least make it useful for yourself, but I'd prefer this not being here at all. And the last complaint that I have about the design that I'm going to call a feature because I've seen every single device do it, went to the T-Mobile store, all their devices did it, a couple of exchange units did it, both sizes of the devices do it. All lines of the Kerr devices I've seen so far do this to some extent, is you've got light that's coming from the panel, now there's no backlight, but the light seems to travel down the glass and it peaks out in certain places. So you've got some light leaking here and here, around the receiver and from the receiver on all sides. And you notice this mostly just when it's a dim environment. Some people won't notice this at all. So it's something I really wouldn't worry about, although I wish they would address this. Possibly if they painted every surface black besides the display surface, that would help. Now let's move on to talking about the display. 
There is no way around it. The AMOLED displays on these units are gorgeous. They are capable of showing a very wide range of colors, even wider than last year, particularly in the reds. They have a fantastic contrast ratio. Blacks are true black. We also have several color profile modes to play around with to suit your liking. It's no wonder people are in love with these displays. There is a lottery in displays though, especially with uniformity. And it's been this way ever since I can remember with AMOLED, so what I'm saying here is nothing new. So luckily I got a good display on my Galaxy S8 the very first try around, but I had to exchange my Galaxy S8 Plus a couple of times until I was happy with it. So I was looking for a display that was both uniform enough to my liking and not of a strange color balance. There's just a lot of variation with AMOLED. You can have a display that looks more bluish, more reddish, more greenish. So good displays are out there, it's just that AMOLED is very tricky to manufacture and variations abound. So if your display is not to your liking, go and exchange it. No software sliders are going to fix it. And yes, this also applies to the red tint issues that we're hearing about. I don't think that these color sliders is a good fix, at least not for everybody. If you have a display with a red tint issue and the display is nice and uniform in color, I think that messing around with those sliders can help. But if your display is not uniform like the one that I had, where I had a nice red band down the middle and the rest was kind of greenish, it's going to pull down the red for that red band, but it's not going to fix the rest of the screen. It's going to make it look more off. Again, the idea here is that if you're not happy with your display, go exchange it. Again, don't rely on software to fix a hardware variation. And anyway, this fix only works underneath the adaptive display mode, which is the least accurate mode. So now let's move on to talking about display specifications. We've got a 5.8 inch display here and a 6.2 inch display. Both of these have the same resolution. They're both Quad HD plus Super AMOLED displays. So we still have the same 1440 pixels across, but now downward we've got 2960. So the big thing today is having a longer aspect ratio. They're both 18.5 to 9. And basically it equates to a display that fills pretty much the entire phone with just very small bezels at the top and the bottom. It really does look fantastic and it's very immersive. So I said that these are Quad HD+, Plus, but by default Samsung has set these guys to Full HD, but it's very easy to change it. You see underneath screen resolution you've got three options. You've got HD+, Plus, which is like 720p, Full HD, which is like 1080p, and then the Quad HD+, Plus, which is the highest resolution. Now the first thing that people notice with the aspect of this display is that yes, you have letterboxing on the side here. You can make the screen full screen if you'd like to have it be more immersive, though it's going to crop. But for me, I don't mind that there's letterboxing on the side because guess what? I now have a place to put my thumbs. There are no bezels on this phone anymore. But with the letterboxing here, look, it works really well. In games, this is going to work really well. So don't be upset about the letterboxing people. You do need to have a place to put your thumbs. So what if black bars are the bane of your existence? Well, underneath display settings, there's an entire section that's devoted just to changing the aspect of applications. So you can make sure that all of these fire up by default as full screen. And some of them, such as Galaxy apps, are already optimized for full screen already. You can see that these ones are blacked out. Just know though, if you decide to have some of the applications in full screen, it does have to crop them. So some UI elements end up being cut off. Some applications might not work right, but it's really, really easy to change if something is cut off. You see, when you go underneath your recents, the app that you are currently in gives you this little icon here that allows you to just change it back to normal. So now you've got the black boxing. So now let's move on to talking about the display's calibration and their color profiles. The most important part of any display is how it looks or how it's calibrated. And I've always really admired Samsung because they give you several different profiles to choose between so that you can be sure that you like how the display looks. So first you got the basic mode, which after measuring looks very close to the sRGB calibration standard, also known as Rec. 709. This is really important for web and consumer content because web and consumer content are based upon the sRGB calibration standard. So things like Netflix and YouTube. Even if you're going to take a picture with the camera here, if you want your photos to look correct, use the basic mode. This is all about color accuracy. 
so they do a good job reaching that sRGB color space. The saturations look pretty accurate. You can tell they're trying to hit that D65 white point, so it's pretty good, but my biggest complaints are that the gamma is a little too high, and actually it's the same like that on all the different modes. When you have gamma that's too high, not only does it make the image look a little bit darker, but a little bit more saturated. So I'm really not sure why they do that, but they do. Then you've got the AMOLED photo mode, so that's going to stretch the range of colors to the Adobe RGB color space. And this is the mode that I usually like using if I'm not searching for color accuracy because it does give you more greens and makes things look more vibrant, but it doesn't do so in a way that's just overwhelming to my eyes. Then you've got AMOLED Cinema, which supposedly uses the DCI-P3 color space. So a really nice wide color space. If you're looking for something that looks really nice and saturated, go ahead and use this mode. Then you've got adaptive display. And honestly, I hate this mode. It says automatically optimize the color range, saturation, and sharpness of your display. This mode may not be compatible with third-party apps. This mode just looks way too oversaturated to me. It's like stabbing my eye with a fork. And it's also got a really bluish cool tone to it for the white point, and I just don't like that. But it is that only mode that allows you to mess around with the color balance. So this might be the preferred mode for some people. Otherwise, this display can reach great peak brightness. It's very visible in direct sunlight. This is a really nice display. Just make sure that you get a good and uniform one. So now is my chance to get really picky. One thing that really bothers me about these displays, and I've measured a couple of them because I've had to exchange a few times, is the annoying grayscale banding that you see particularly affecting darker midtones and shadows. So certain gradients look a little bit weird. This is something I've noticed to be a problem for a very long time with AMOLED though, so this is nothing new. This better represents what I'm talking about. So here is a grayscale that goes all the way from 21 down to zero. So you're seeing here that the gray colors are actually a little bit different. Some end up looking a little bit more greenish, some a little bit more bluish. So that shows up in gradients. So for the final part of this review, let's move on to talking about the crazy feature set that these devices have. There are so many features on these devices that I want to take some time going through them. I know that most people won't even tap into just a small amount of what these phones can do. So let's first talk about some of the hardware features that these devices offer. So both of them are IP68 water and dust resistant, so you should be able to put it in water down to 1.5 meters for a half hour, and it should be just fine, as long as you don't have water jets going on it or anything. So for somebody like me who lives in Washington, I really like having water resistant devices. It gives me the extra sense of security. One of the most obvious hardware changes over last year is you can see that we no longer have that home button. The fingerprint sensor has now been moved to the back. And to those who don't really pay attention to the details, that hardware home button is still there. It's just now underneath the display. A good demonstration to represent that the hardware button is still there is when you're watching videos, for example. You can see that there is no UI element here, but still, if I press down, it exits out of the application. So I very well could swipe and see the UI element and touch that and go out. Or I can simply just press down and it acts still as a hardware home button, so I think that's quite cool. Also, with this on-screen hardware button, you do have some options. So you can choose the home button sensitivity, adjust the amount of pressure needed to hard press the home button. I have it just smack dab in the middle there. And there's also this haptic engine when you press it, and you do have the option to choose how much vibration feedback you get from that. So underneath sounds and vibration, you have vibration intensity. And this will give you a more intense zing when you press on the home button. So everything is crazily customizable here. The next awesome hardware feature to talk about are these AMOLED displays. And of course, we've already covered these in a lot of depth, but having these AMOLED displays does enable some really nice features such as always on display. So when you turn the display off, you can see that all the other pixels are turned off in black, except for just a section that will display the time, the date, so you have options for a digital clock, analog clock, world clock, calendar, image, and your edge clock. And they give you several options such as changing your clock style, you can change the color of the elements, and you can also choose your background. You can even interact with the on-screen display features, such as I have a YouTube video playing. You can see I can pause and also play it in the background, just have the audio coming through. You can even click on various notification elements. For example, if I click here, 
I can log into my phone and it brings me to the setting. So if there's a message, you can double click on it and unlock your phone and it will bring you into the message. So it's really quite handy. Now being that this is an edged display device, Samsung is still keeping on with their edge display features and I actually haven't disabled them because there's some interesting ones. Here's Smart Select. Now obviously this is not a Note device, but it looks like Samsung has tried to add back some of the Note features. So here with Smart Select, it says select an area to capture as an image or GIF animation. You can pin an image so that it always shows at the top. So you've got your standard Smart Select fair right here. You can select a rectangle, an oval, you can make a quick GIF animation. Let's go ahead and try that out. Hit done. And you can draw on it, you can share it, you can set this image on your always on display, and you can save it to the gallery. And it also gives you an option to extract text. So that's kind of cool. So we don't have a pen, but we do have some of the neat features that the pen has. And then the last little tidbit under here is called pin to top. Now just say for whatever reason, I need this bit of information. It's extremely pertinent and important. Or just say you need a phone number or an address or something, pin to top. And it's always going to be there. So you can go through your day and it'll always stay right in the forefront of your attention. So that's actually kind of clever. If you triple click on it, you can either save it to the gallery, you can get rid of it, or you can minimize it if it's in the way, obviously. And of course you can remove it. As for other bits having to do with the display, you can change your screen resolution, HD+, Full HD+, and also Quad HD+. You can do this at your own whim by going underneath the display settings. You can see here screen resolution. Or they also have presets that you can set up. So if you hold down on here, you can see that it brings us underneath performance mode. So you have the option for optimized game, entertainment, and high performance. And all of these you can customize yourself. I think it's kind of cool that we can easily enable whatever preset profile. You've also got your blue light filter and during nighttime or during evening times, this can be very useful. Use blue light filter at night to help you sleep better. The idea is that that blue light keeps your brain awake, makes it harder for you to fall asleep. And you can change that around however you'd like. You can turn it on or off as you choose, or you can have it scheduled. The last bit pertaining specifically to the display is that you can change the navigation bar. You can see that there are no longer any capacitive buttons here. So what's nice is that you can change it how you'd like navigation bar and you can choose your layout. So you can see bada bing, bada boom, it's switched. Now moving on to talking about sensors and software. On the front here, we now have an iris scanner camera. So this is a feature that came from the Galaxy Note 7 and it's really nice and handy to use, especially for those who don't like the fingerprint sensor on the back. In my experience, it works really well. It only takes a little bit longer than a second to unlock. You don't have to hold it in any weird type of position. As long as the camera is in line sight of your eyes, it works really well. Plus Samsung has made some adjustments since we first saw this debuted in the Galaxy Note 7. With the Galaxy Note 7, you had to swipe upward once the display was on in order to execute the iris scanner. And now Samsung has implemented a setting that allows you to use the iris scanner as soon as the display is on. So that's really nice. All you have to do is hit the power button and there it is. You can see here's the camera and the infrared LED. So it can be as simple as holding the phone up, touching here, boom. It sees your eyes, now you're in. Another camera driven security feature is called face recognition. So you can unlock the device with your face and that is not something new. That's something that's been available in Android for a long time, but Samsung has implemented their own software. But unfortunately it's not very secure. So it can't be used for secure folder or making payments, but it's just a very quick unlock mechanism and it works very fast. Another useful sensor that we have on this device is the fingerprint scanner. And like I told you guys, muscle memory has kicked in for me and I don't mind the position anymore. It is not in a favorable position and it can be difficult to get used to at first and you can smudge up that camera. But this is actually my preferred means of unlocking the device still. Plus it's really nice that there is an option to allow swipe to access your notification panel. And as someone who went from using the Google Pixel to this phone, it's very, very nice to have. Now taking a peek at Samsung Health, there are a variety of sensors that work together to make this app possible. What I really love is the automatic pedometer. This thing is going to track your steps automatically. 
as soon as you set this application up, unless you pause the steps. So even if I forget, if I'm out on the trail, it's going to track my steps for me. And this is actually a really great exercise motivator. You can also set it up to detect your workouts. So if it detects that I'm doing any type of an activity for 10 minutes, it's going to give a summary of that workout, such as the duration, distance, calories burnt. And that is all thanks to the sensors that are in this phone. Some people might find this a little bit intrusive, but you can turn everything off if you don't like it. And if you want to get super motivated, you can show your steps in the notification panel. You've also got a sensor on the back that they've been using for a very long time. You can measure your heart rate and also your oxygen saturation of your blood. None of this is meant for professional medical opinion. It's just really nice to see your own health trends. And just as an aside, I also find it interesting under Samsung Health that you can now schedule online doctor visits. That seems a bit intrusive to me and not something I'd want to do on my phone, especially because of course it's going to ask you for your insurance information. But hey, this thing includes everything but the kitchen sink. You can even record how much water you've consumed from your kitchen sink. Now looking at Samsung Pay, it uses both NFC and MST, which is Magnetic Secure Transmission, to make payments in stores. And this is really, really nice because a couple of days ago, I forgot my wallet, walked into the store. It didn't have one of those platforms where I could pay with NFC. But because it has MST, it essentially works like a swipeable credit card. And this baffles people all the time. I got into an argument with a barista at Starbucks one day because she said, absolutely, this would not work there. And it did. So that's pretty cool. So now let's move on to talking about software within the user experience. The first thing I want to point out is the change of their launcher. Finally, the joke that was TouchWiz is gone. And they now have something that is very clean, very simple and easy to use. The menus aren't crowded and ugly. Things make sense where they're placed. Everything is just making sense. There aren't a bunch of crazy gaudy colors underneath their default theming. And I really love what they've done to simplify how you access your applications. You can see it's now like a carousel. You can go up or down to access the app tray. Of course, then it's just scrolling within the app tray. So there's no button to access the app drawer. And I actually think that this simplifies things. I think this is clean. It makes me enjoy using this phone. But if for some reason you're nostalgic or you want to have your app button, you can go underneath your home screen settings, hit app button, Show apps button, apply. Now I can't imagine why you would do this, but there you have it. So that is an option. Now, just because they have simplified their launcher, don't for one second think that this is not a less bloated phone. There are more features now than ever before. And it gets a little bit laggy sometimes. This is not the smoothest of devices. I will talk about that in part two of this review, but at least the beauty and the style of this makes up for those little bits of slowdown. So a feature that's classic by now is being able to change your wallpapers and your themes. This is something that I end up obsessing endlessly about. There's just so many choices, so many themes, a lot of third party themes, all extremely gorgeous. I mean, I got 32 right here under trial mode. So I tend to go a little bit crazy with the theming. Now this is where I do better sometimes going back to my iPhone for a few days. So I stop playing with my phone endlessly trying to customize things, but it's an option. And it's one that I really appreciate. You've got wallpapers, themes, custom icons, and icons for the always on display galore. You can certainly make this device your own. And by the way, I'm sure a lot of you guys are asking, what's your theme? What theme do you use? Well, since I tend to over obsess, I've decided to stay with the default theme. And then I got myself a nice wallpaper. And I actually bought this wallpaper from the Samsung store. So it's called Colored Dust 2. And there you are. Another feature that I really love that Samsung has had for a while that really helps with the user experience, especially because I have small hands, is being able to shrink the screen. So this is one-handed mode. And since I'm holding it with my left hand, I can easily switch sides. There we go. I think that they've made this really nice and simple to access. I have this accessible with a triple button press. To get rid of it, just touch here. Do it again. There you go. You can take a look at the settings. You can enable a gesture. It says swipe up diagonally from either bottom corner. It's easier for me to triple click on the home button. Another feature that has existed for quite some time, but now actually really makes sense is the split screen view. You've got this really large screen real estate now. So it just makes sense now to have two apps open at the same time. So go ahead, 
select split screen view, pick, I don't know, the Google app. Check that out. Look how much room you have here, especially on the Plus device. You also have a couple options under here, so you can pin a part of the screen to the top. You can switch these around. And we've still got the option to use pop-up view, so go ahead and touch on that. It minimizes one of these windows. You can move it around if you'd like. You can also change the size. You can see it makes it a lot smaller. And then you can go right back into multi-window view, put it back up to the top. You can also access pop-up view by holding from the corner and pulling downward. And you can have up to five of these open at a time. So if you have a bunch of them, they start getting in the way, just minimize them. You end up with this cute little button. We can do this with the Google app as well. And what's nice now is that they have paired them together so you can easily multitask between them. Just click here to make it bigger again. Open this one, you can bring it right back into multi-window view. There you go. So this is all a little bit persnickety, but you really do have a nice multitasking interface now, especially with this larger display. We've got a device maintenance menu, which makes sure that your device is running as smoothly as possible. So you can manage things like battery, performance mode, storage and memory, or RAM. Then going further underneath the battery settings, I really like what's offered here. So we've got app power monitor. It looks to see which applications are using the most power and you can choose to put them to sleep. This just helps to extend your battery life to the best possible. You can check what your battery usage is like. And you've also got your power saving modes. So you can choose either mid or max, and this is very similar to what we've had before. So selecting mid, it's fully customizable as you can see all these settings here. And it tells you roughly how much battery power you will be saving. And this is the equivalent of the extreme power saving mode where you've got an all black interface and just a couple of allowed applications. But this is definitely the way to go if you need to have your battery lasting you for several days. Then lastly, for UX features, we've got secure folder, and it's really nice that you have the option to select it right here underneath the drop down menu. And I cutely named my secure folder, don't touch, go away. So now that this is selected and is highlighted in blue, you can see the folder. When I deselect it, turns it off, you no longer see it. Very, very nice. So don't touch, go away. And this is a really nice, cool little interface. So it's like having a whole protected partition of your phone storage. You can install applications on here. You can have protected contacts, calendar, photos. You can protect various files. So I can have inbox in here and only have very specific email accounts only showing up in here. And you've got settings galore here for how you can access your information. So for the business person or for that teen who really doesn't want the parental units getting into the phone, well, you know, that can be very useful. So the last thing that I want to talk about in this review is Bixby, which is Samsung's artificial intelligence service and also their digital assistant. And what people are not so enchanted by is that Samsung has built in a button specifically meant to pull up Bixby Home. One click is supposed to bring up this Bixby Home and a long press is supposed to bring up their voice assistant. Samsung does not want you to be able to remap this, but of course people have gone around it. I have BX Actions on here, for example. I can go ahead and hit start the app. This didn't need to be rooted or anything. You can see now if I press this, I've got Google Now that starts up. It's not perfect, it's a little bit buggy. You could probably find a better app that works a little bit better. So you can get some good utility out of this button. If I'm being honest about Bixby and what I think about it, right now it just feels really very primitive. Bixby voice doesn't even work yet. Supposedly we will have that sometime this year. Who knows, one day it could be just as good as Google Now. Honestly, when Google Now launched, I hated it. I did not want to use Google Now. I thought it was intrusive, annoying, lacked features. So who knows, Samsung could be onto something. I'm not going to shut down something that is so new that we really don't know much about it or their future plans. So here in Bixby Home, you've got several cards. I have it set up as I like it, at least as I tolerate it. I've got my suggested applications, things that I use a lot. I have several briefings of choice. I have a card about trading on Twitter, some nearby restaurants, some current images in my gallery, Samsung themes. And of course you can disable all of these at will. I've got today's weather and my heart rate, my today's activity. So it's, it's kind of cool, but really not so functional just yet. The only thing that I actually find useful is being able to go underneath the camera. And now you can take a picture of what you're looking at. And underneath the gallery, you can hit Bixby Vision. 
it's going to assess the image and then I can search for an image online or I can hit shopping. Let's see what this brings up. Shopping. And it's not doing a perfect job, but it did recognize that it is a Samsung cell phone of sorts. Ah, actually, here we go. It did find it. You don't have to take the image first. You can simply go underneath your camera. Turn on Bixby Vision right here in, underneath the camera interface. You can see it recognizes something there. Let's see what it pulls up. Shopping. And it does about the same as before. Hit image. It will try to find similar images online. And it says, it's a smartphone. What do you expect from me? So it tells you to point the camera at an object or a location. And it really should try to do its best. I have some other examples where it worked and where it didn't. So I held it before a LaCroix soda can, if that's how you pronounce it, and it did pull up some results. I took a picture of a picture in my apartment and it found where you could purchase it online. Here's some pollo caldo from a really great Mexican restaurant and it tried to do a decent job. So it knew it was a soup. I tried to have it so many times assess what this closed umbrella was and it just couldn't do it. Tried my husband and it decided to match him up with Chris Pratt. I guess that's nice. Here's a pepper grinder, and it did find other pepper grinders. Another thing it tries to do is extract text. So you can see this says, this is a test. Hello. So text. This is a test. And it should analyze it for me and hit extract. And you can see that it's really not so useful for handwriting. This is pretty legible. But what it does do well is extract printed text. So this was just a B&O catalog. Just surround the text that you want. Hit text. Extract. And there you can see it does pretty well. It even knows how to extract addresses so that you can go ahead and look at it in maps. Then lastly, you have a translate option too. So I can change the translated language to, I don't know, how about German? Just select what you want to be translated. And it tries to do its best. So I will really wait to assess what I think about Bixby until the full Bixby services are released. I think it has some promise. Samsung does try to create an ecosystem with their phones if Samsung Pay wasn't a hint or Samsung Health. But if it's something that really bothers you, just remap the button and forget about it for now. It might end up actually being kind of neat. We don't know. So now we are wrapping this up. We've had a chance to look at many things with this phone, the build and the design and the look of this phone. We've had a chance to look at the display, a lot of features, tons and tons of features that this phone offers. Please stay tuned for part two. That is where I'm definitely going to be getting more technical talking about battery life performance. I'm gonna take a look at the camera. Of course, you can leave some feedback down below to let me know what else you have some questions about if I didn't cover something. So this is all that I want to say for now. My impression is so far that these are really great phones. I think that anybody would really be happy to have them. I think Samsung is maturing, growing up. Their ecosystem is maturing. These are really beautiful devices that I think that just about anybody would be happy to have in their pockets. So this is all that I want to say for now. This has been Erica, the technology nerd, likes to film stuff. Please rate, comment, and subscribe. Hope you enjoyed the video. Please stay tuned for the next one and have a good night.